Well, we are living in a world gone wrong, aren't we? I, it, this world has gone so wrong that I'm even reluctant to watch the news. All you have to do is read the headlines and you can see that the world is not what God designed it to be. How do we live in that world? That's what we're talking about this month. Uh, how we live in a world gone wrong. And today I want to um, look back at the book of 1 Peter, where Peter is talking to a group of churches that are under fairly strong Roman oppression. And he's guiding them how they interact with that persecution. We're going to be in the middle of the second chapter of 1 Peter here in just a minute, if you want to turn there. And I want to be um, up front with you. I'm going to talk today about how to react when we are, uh, we would typically become angry, all right? Worldly wisdom tells us that we need to stand up for ourselves. It's kind of a maxim that many of us have used, that many of us have heard. If you don't stand up for yourself, no one will. And so you need to be strong and confront those people who are not treating you properly. I want to tell you a little story about this Maxim. Uh, I didn't, I forgot to get permission to use names, so I'll just say it was a nurse that I know who worked in Meadow Lake Hospital about 10 years ago. And uh, she was working at Meadow Lake when Integris was still one of the, um, the, the, well, it was the top employer in the state. It was considered the best place in the state of Oklahoma to work, Integris Hospital System. Meadow Lake is part of their chain, and this Nurse had worked there for a number of years and had gotten to the point where she was uh, earning quite a bit of vacation every year. Uh, back then, I, I have no idea what Integris is like now, but back then, if you worked full-time, you would get a certain number of hours off for every pay period, and then if you worked a little overtime, that went up a little bit. And uh, she was to the point where she was earning a month off every year for vacation, and she decided she was going to take some of that time. So in January or February, she went to her manager and said in October, or it was either October or November, it wasn't Christmas, but it was late in the year, she was going to take three, she would like to take three weeks off and go on a trip. And so they, she submitted the paperwork, and she got permission to take those three weeks off. She went and bought the hotel, got the hotel reservations, bought the tickets, paid all the deposits that she needed to pay to go on her trip. Then in July, they had a mass exodus of employees. And the management came down and said, because we don't have enough employees, we're going to have to limit vacations to one week this year. You can still earn it. We'll let you carry some of it over. But we're only going to be able to give you one week of vacation this year. And in the middle of the staff meeting, this nurse raised her hand and said, what about vacations that are already approved? And the manager said, that applies to those two. If you've already requested your vacation, you have to resubmit the request. And she just dropped it. And when the manager walked out, the rest of the staff went ballistic. You should have called her this. You should have told her that. You should have demanded this. You should have done that. You should take care of yourself. If you don't stand up for yourself, who will? There's a problem with that philosophy. It brings the inevitable result of that becoming our default, where we instinctively go to blowing our top. It creates an attitude within us that where it's us against them. It creates the, uh, what they used to call the rat race. You know what the rats are, right? Rat race is when you have, have two competing departments or competing divisions or completing sales forces that are competing for the same thing, and the two rats are racing to get that asset. You know what the problem with a rat race is? Every time you have a rat race, it's a rat that wins, and that's what we become. We develop the attitude that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world and that we've got to be the top dog. And, and as time goes by, it leaves us with no other instinctive response than to become angry. So the question this morning is, what is the proper response when we're frustrated? What does the Scripture say 
we should do when the world would expect us to just blow our top? I would like to suggest this morning the word meekness. The word meekness, it, I, I have to define that before I go any further because I know what's going to happen. I say the word meekness and somebody in this room, probably several people in this room, are instinctively going to think doormat. Somebody who never stands up for themselves. Someone who, who is constantly being run over. But that's not really the definition of meekness, not from a scriptural point of view. I like the definition that's given by the Institute for Basic Life Principles. It's a little wordy, but they define meekness as yielding your rights to God so he can demonstrate his peace and power through us. Like I said, that's a little bit wordy. The Advanced Training Institute gives a shorter definition that's essentially the same. It's yielding my personal rights and expectations to God. Notice both definitions have the world yielding in it. It's giving up to God something that I had the right to or could expect so that he can use it his way. With that definition in mind, I want to look now at 1 Peter, starting in the middle of chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 11. And we're going to look at how Peter says to be humble, to be meek in front of several different groups. Now, you have to remember, Peter is writing to a group of brand new Christians, first generation Christians, that are all, they're, they're all associated geographically at the north edge of what we would call Turkey. Several different Roman provinces are there and the churches have started. We're getting somewhere into the late 1950s, or 1950s, 50s AD, the first century, and the the churches are brand new, and some of them have not really been uh, trained well. They haven't had a lot of uh, input on how to understand Scripture. At the same time, an emperor by the name of Nero has come to power. And Nero was crazy. Nero was a nutcase. Every historian I've ever read or heard from on Nero said he was probably certifiable. He's the kind of guy who would stand on his roof with his violin in his hand and play background music while the whole city was burning. And he realized early on in his rule that if he needed to distract attention from what he was doing or somebody else was doing, the Christians were really good scapegoats because the Roman emperor had not yet, the empire had not yet determined how to deal with Christians and didn't really know where they fit in. And they were thought of as kind of weird. And so if something's going wrong, you can blame it on the Christians and you don't have to deal with it. And he's been persecuting the Christians in different parts of the empire for a few years now. How should this group of churches react to that kind of environment? Notice verse 11 he starts out by telling us, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, Fear God, honor the emperor. You'll notice as we go through this passage that Peter repeatedly uses the word subject. Subject yourself. Some of your translations will use the word submit. Same Greek word. The important thing to notice here is that this is a voluntary subjection. It's the way the word was used in Greek and by Roman, especially the Roman military 
was to voluntarily put your unit of men under the command of another military officer for the good of the common campaign. It was never seen by Romans or Greeks as a, a, identifying someone of lesser value. And it was always voluntary. So he says to them, submit for the Lord's sake for every human institution. Submit to the government. He talks about the emperor. Some of your translations will say king instead of emperor. To submit to the governors who rule in his place in the more local areas. He's speaking directly to them and Nero's oppression of the church. He's saying you do this so that God gets the glory. For this is the will of God, verse 15, that by doing, by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Now, one of my favorite catchphrases is read the whole Bible. If you read the whole Bible, you will find other places where it says when the government is doing evil things, you don't cooperate. But in this case, even when the king, the emperor, the governor is persecuting the church, we need to be careful how we react to that. Because we don't want to be inadvertently entering into the rat race or entering into the accusations and demonstrating a very angry response so that we are open to the accusation of doing wrong. Peter, being very practical, does not leave it simply with the government, though. He goes on to talk about the workplace. He talks about servants and how they should react to their masters. Instantly, we recognize what Peter is talking about here is uh, uh, the slave-slave owner relationship. I, wanna, I, I always feel like I have to say this, okay? Greek slavery, Roman slavery was not the same as American slavery was in the first part of our history. Uh, our, our history with slavery is horrendous. It's terrible. It's horrible. I would never, ever want to say anything that would um, cause someone to confusingly assume that I am endorsing slavery or that the Bible endorses slavery of that kind. What we're talking about here, and the, and the reason why the English Standard Version uses the word servant instead of slave is because this was like a voluntary servanthood. The, some of your translations will translate it bond servant. It's someone who found themselves in a position where financially they were better off letting someone else be in charge and run their life for a period of time. And they were only bonded to that person for a period of time until they had done service enough to pay off a debt or to, to earn enough down payment to start their own business or whatever it is that they had reached an agreement with, with their master. In our culture, we're talking the same thing as an employee, somebody who hires out for an hourly wage or to exercise a skill for another company. Keep that in mind as I read these verses. Servants, be subject to your master's with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called... Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Some of us have had the experience of working for a, um, a boss that wasn't really a, a moral or... Um, Beneficial person. We'll use that word, beneficial. A little trick for you here. When you read the Bible, in the culture that the Bible was written in, Jewish, Greek, Roman, all those together, the word good and evil had less moral implication 
than it did practical implication. Something that was good was something that would bring a profit or a benefit down the road. Something that was evil was something that would bring loss down the road. Often financially, but sometimes other ways. So you might be working with a boss that's taking all the credit for your work. That happens all the time. And Peter is saying, in meekness, be subject to that. There's a bigger goal than just your recognition at work here. You're actually emulating Jesus. Jesus, who was persecuted worse than any human being on earth was ever persecuted. One of these days I'll deliver my messages on the suffering of Christ and the the horrible things that they did to him. We're emulating our Savior. And oftentimes, by doing so, it gives God a chance to work in ways that we could not even possibly imagine. But Peter is going to get even more personal than that. He's going to talk about the home. Starting in chapter 3, verse 1, he says it, likewise. Always look for those little conjunctions. Likewise, he's continuing to talk about the same subject here. Wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see their respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adornment be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold, gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. In the home, the concept of submission, again, voluntarily setting aside, yielding your expectations and your rights for the common good is what Peter is calling these people to in the home. Wives, submit, voluntarily submit yourselves to your husbands. That is one verse that has been misused by the church. Some of you are grinning. You, can, you know what I'm going to say. This verse and verses like it have been used to justify some horrendous treatment of wives. Physical abuse, exploitation, horrible things. Women, that is not what Peter is saying here. Don't forget, his words to the men are still coming. What, what he's saying to the women is, you voluntarily support him. Help him follow Jesus. You voluntarily yield some of your rights so that he can grow. He talks about men, husbands that are not even believers yet. You live in a way that they will be able to easily come to faith in Jesus Christ. And then he says, be beautiful, but not, not outwardly beautiful, okay? And he, and he talks about beauty of the heart and all this stuff, and all, that's good. But notice that he says that your beauty should not be braided hair or jewelry or the clothes you wear. That, again, has been misused. Many of us can remember going to church on Sunday morning and one of the ladies walks in with a little rouge on her cheeks, and she became the topic of conversation for the next six weeks, didn't she? How dare she wear makeup to church? And they would use verses like this to support that. Read the whole Bible, folks. In this very passage, Peter says, don't be like that. Don't be somebody who's outward only. Be like Sarah. Sarah. You remember who Sarah was? She was the wife of Abraham. You remember what happened when Abraham went to Egypt? Sarah was such a, a beautiful woman that she caused a national incident. Pharaoh said, yeah, she ought to be mine. And he took Sarah 
and God had to come down and tell Pharaoh, you're doing the wrong thing? Almost caused a war. A little bit after that, Abraham is going through the territory of the Philistines. Abimelech sees Sarah. Yep, she's mine. I'm taking her. Almost caught, it actually caused a health scandal there. Not a single woman in that whole time that Abraham was in Philistia had a baby. God made them all barren for Sarah's sake. She was not an unattractive woman. She is the illustration that Peter uses for what real beauty is. Because she, this is the word, okay? Secret for all the women. You want a happy husband? This is the word. Respected her man. Men feel the need to be respected. They feel your love when you treat them with respect. And Sarah knew how to do that. And Peter is saying, that is the right kind of subjection for a woman to give to her man. And then he talks to the men. Notice he doesn't use the word subject in verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives. He goes on to call them weaker vessels. If you're going to decorate your house, a weaker vessel, a weaker, uh, a more delicate, let's use that word. That's a good word that, to translate here. A delicate knickknack isn't less valuable. It's more valuable. In my understanding, some of the most delicate Household decorations ever created was the Fabrice egg. And those things have not for generations sold for less than six figures. The more delicate they are, the more valuable they are to us. And that's how men are to look at their wives. Yes, we are bigger. Most of the time we're bigger. In our culture, it's not always that way. But most of the time we have the physical strength to dominate our wives. Peter is saying to them, Consider that delicacy something of value and be gentle with them. Be careful with them. And then he throws in a subtle little threat for the sake of your prayers. God is going to deal with you the way you deal with your wives. And so in the household, both husband and wife are called to yield their rights and their expectations for the common good, for God's glory. And then he finishes by speaking to the entire congregation. All the congregations together, so to speak. Verse 8 says, finally, all of you. That's the key there, all of you. Every single member of every one of these churches have unity of mind, sympathy, brother, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you have been called, that you may obtain a blessing. For, and then the rest of this passage is I quote from Psalm uh, 34, a call to worship, by the way. Psalm 34 is a call to worship. It says, whoever desires to love life and to see good, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. All of you, all of the people who call themselves Christians in this north part of Turkey, are to work towards unity, focusing on the mission that God has given us and not our own personal desires, expectations, or rights. All of us are to let brotherly love, another translation for that is brotherly affection, to guide us. Be tenderhearted and humble-minded. That's where the concept of meekness comes from. That word in Greek, it can be translated meek. And so Peter has outlined Four different types of relationships that a person would have in the first century and how to respond meekly to those in the presence of persecution. It's not hard to make the equivalent admonitions in the 21st century, is it? It's pretty easy to look at 
Peter, and imagine him speaking to us, living in a pretty messed up world, and him simply saying to us, get along. Just make getting along a higher priority for you. In society, when you interact with the people down at the DMV, the cop on the corner, get along with them. In the workplace, when you've got that uh, fellow employee that's just a jerk, Make it your goal to be the one who's trying to get along in the home. Again, there are other passages that protect women and men from abuse, but the primary goal is to get along, and especially in the church. Folks, if your primary goal, your greatest priority in this church is to have a certain color of carpet okay, or certain color of drapes on the wall, I'm certain there's a church in town for you. But this congregation is focusing on glorifying God and receive the mission of making disciples. You're invited to join into that. Come and be a member of a congregation that's making disciples. So how do we do it though? Okay, just saying go do it isn't fair. You need some help to get that done. And here's the principle. You get this done by voluntarily arranging your priorities as subordinate to others. Somebody in the room is saying, well, I've never heard that before. I don't think that's right. That's okay. You can think that. All you have to do is go look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, where Paul says these words specifically, consider others more important than yourself. Paul also, in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. That's actually a very freeing phrase, because it proclaims that there is a level that you should think of yourself at, but not to go past that. Paul is asking us all to be meek, to be submissive for the benefit of something greater. And it's really not hard to do. It's really very easy to do that. I mean, think about it. We restrict our speed when we're driving, don't we? I just made a trip to my parents' house this weekend. It's about three-hour drive north, and I got on the interstate, and I was going at the interstate speed. It's 75 now. Okay, so I'm driving north on... Interstate 135, or Interstate 35, 75 miles an hour, pew, 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 and not all of those license plates were from Texas. <laughs> so I finally realized I'm holding up traffic here. I've got to go a little faster, but I never got fast enough where I was passing everybody else because I didn't want to become the hazard on the road. I didn't want to be too slow. I didn't want to be too fast where I was making other people's lives in jeopardy. We do that all the time. We, we subordinate our recreation to non-working times, don't we? I mean, if we were driving down the a country road out here and we saw a guy sitting in a 150, well, that's too cheap, $500,000 tractor, okay? And he's sitting there with the implement and the, 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 the plows are stuck in the ground and he's sitting there in the, the cab not going anywhere and he's watching a football game, we would think he's nuts, wouldn't we? That, that type of recreation is for a different time. Drive the tractor. We don't go to work, and set up our little phone, and watch the baseball game when we're supposed to be working for our employers. We do that voluntarily, right? We arrange our travel around the school schedule. Okay, the school has a fall break and a Christmas break and a spring break and summer break, and most people will arrange their travel around those breaks. Can you imagine going into the school and saying, uh, we think it would be more economical and more convenient to take our vacation in October, so we're going to take three weeks off, and we don't want you to count our kids absent. We don't do that. I mean, we think about that. That's ridiculous. We wouldn't do that, right? We voluntarily rearrange our schedule because the school has a significant mission to carry out. We do it all the time. And we do it for a greater reason. We don't just do it to make the highway safe or work environment productive. 
Notice I didn't make any comments about verses 11 and 12. Let me go back and read those verses again for you. Verse 11 says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. I started this message by saying anger is not necessarily the best reaction. But we tend in our culture to make that our knee-jerk reaction. Do you know what happens when a person gets angry? You know what happens in, in the mind, in the brain? It changes the chemistry. And people get kind of a, a high out of being angry. And if you're angry long enough, and suddenly you find yourself not angry, you don't become peaceful. You go into withdrawals. And you get depressed. Because you become dependent on those epinephrines and norepinephrines and dopamines that flow through your brain that give you a buzz. Don't let that flesh control you, is what Peter is saying here in verse 11. Then in verse 12 he says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Sometimes we go past those subordinate clauses a little too fast. On the day of visitation, that's Peter's way of saying judgment day. And I've been criticized for saying this, and maybe I have in the past made a little bit stronger case than is justified. But part of the way we live is to make judgment day easy for Jesus. Oh, sure. It's, it's great that we live a certain way and we put our faith in Jesus early and we live in obedience to the way he says life works best. And when we get to judgment day, we win the crown of life for those who manage life's trials well. Or we win the incorruptible crown for those who uh, control their bodies and the passions that come with it. But while we're doing that, People make fun of us. They accuse you of missing out on all the fun. They say you're strange. You're weird. You're no fun. We don't want you around. You're, what's the phrase they use? You're harsh in my high or whatever it is. So that they, make, they try to make you feel bad for being different. But on judgment day, they're going to be there too. Jesus says the day is coming when he will sit on his throne and he'll separate the people, some on his right hand, some on his left hand. And those that have not put their trust in Jesus on that day are going to have to admit God was right. They're going to have to say we should have done it God's way. And for all of us, God's way starts the same way. We start by recognizing that God is real, that we have offended him, violated him, and broken his laws, and that Jesus is the only one who can pay that debt for us. And by putting our trust in him, we can start that walk of living in a way that focuses on his kingdom and his glory. We can start yielding so that he can do the work that only he can do. And if we start that way and we continue that way, we get some pretty tremendous benefits out of it. I mean, just think about it. The reputation that you get for being someone who gets along, someone who's a, a team player, someone who is capable of, of working with or socializing with almost anyone is a reputation most of us would enjoy. The, the peace in life of just not being angry all the time and having a little more contentment, and the unity that it produces. I started this by telling the story of a friend of mine who was uh, working at Meadow Lake and had planned a three-week vacation and was told after she had put down all the deposits and paid all the expenses that she wasn't going to be allowed to have that. Her fellow employers thought she should throw a hissy fit, advised her even on what words to use, what names to call people. Instead, she waited. She went into the manager's office by herself 
and said, I'm not going to make your life rough, but I did do what I was supposed to do and I got approval for my vacation and I am invested heavily in it. I think you should do something, something so that I don't have all this loss. The manager did not throw a fit. The manager did not get angry. The manager asked for a, couple, a little while to look into it. I don't remember how long it was. A week or two later, they called her back in the office and said, you know, I'm glad you approached it the way you did. Because my administrators would never let me bend the policies for somebody who was rebellious and throwing a tantrum. But since you gave me the time to look into it, and you treated me with respect, and you treated the organization with respect... Our human resources department has decided that they will obligate, they will uh, observe their obligation that they made to give you your time off. She didn't have to throw a hissy fit. She didn't have to call people names. She put God's glory first. And she got what she was right for her to have. It does happen. By meekness, we as believers in Jesus Christ can make a messed up world a little bit better. We do it by making God's glory our primary goal and yielding everything in our life to the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your watch care over us. I thank you for promising us that in the long run, everything works together for our good, for those who are in Christ Jesus. I thank you for the guidance on how to interact with each other and people outside of the church. And I confess, Father, that um, most of this message was probably as much for me, maybe more for me than anybody else. I also thank you for your grace your forgiveness when we fail. I ask you to strengthen us and guide us to be wisely submissive people and recognize that we have something significant to submit our rights and expectations to. And I ask you to take our lives and our submission to you and use them for your glory in whatever way you see fit to be glorified. I thank you for all of your responses and graces to us in Jesus' name. Amen.